And without further delay, I would like to introduce you the first speaker. It's uh, Albert Taken. He's director of uh, aquatic farms in Hawaii, US. He's uh, also a global consultant for the aquaculture industry. Uh, also worked with FAO in the past and, um, and he's very well known for his work in fish nutrition. So, Albert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here. I'm going to give an overview of, of the aquaculture sector and how it's been growing. The publication is jointly with Mark Mitain, um, who also joins me in this publication. Um, of all the different food production systems in the world, aquaculture is one of the sectors that's been growing most rapidly over the last 20 years. Um, increasing ninefold from 10 million tons to 19 million tons from 84 to 2012. It's a sector that's growing on average about 8.1% per year compared with capture fisheries, which is where the supplies are more or less st stagnant. Um, and so the problem is, can we keep the sector growing like this in the future? By production, sorry, um, we have 90 million tons. Half of the production is fish, 44 million tons. We have aquatic plants, seaweeds, again, mainly for human consumption in China, Japan, Korea, and also Indonesia. We have mollusks, and then we have crustaceans. By value, we have about $144 billion industry. Um, but in terms of aquatic meat production, farmed aquatic meat is number fourth in the world. Number one is pig. Uh, second is um, chicken, and then we have beef. So it's in the fourth place. This is mainly um, farm fish and farm crustaceans and mollusks. This is globally, but if you look at China, in China the production of farmed aquatic food products is second to the production of pigs. And as we heard this morning in the first presentation, China, as we will see, produces 60% of total global aquaculture production. It's a big country and they're hungry and they need to feed. And aquaculture is, is a possible solution. Um, aquaculture is very much an Asian phenomenon. 91% is produced in the Asian region. Over 94% is produced within developing countries, not in the economically um, more developed countries from an economic perspective. So it's very much an Asian phenomenon. So though here um, um, the industry is not that well known in, in Asia, it's, it's about protein consumption and it's about the, the affordability of, of fish products. Um, as I said, China is number one, 60% of global production is produced in China. And you'll see the top eight countries are all in Asia. That's Indonesia, India, Vietnam, the Philippines, Bangladesh, Korea, and then Norway is um, in eighth. Um, this is all in, in, in metric tons, so it's 1.3 million tons, but it, it's very small in comparison to China, which is 94, I mean 54 million tons. But this is a total aquatic product, so it includes plants, it includes mollusks, and also includes finfish. If you look at the, the top 20 countries in the world, um, Again, the, the countries in blue are, are the non-Asian countries, but you can see some countries like Chile. In parentheses, you've got here the, the growth rate since 1984. Um, so you've got double-digit growth rates for many countries, Norway, Chile, Brazil, Egypt. But other countries, like some other developed countries, um, the growth rate of the industry is, is, is very poor, and it's stagnated. So... The industry is, is um, very big and it's very different in, in different countries. But another important thing, this should, be, this should say 510, is that in aquaculture, of the species that we have to feed with a diet, we have 59 species of crustaceans, 354 species of finfish. And that compares with only 18 in terrestrial agriculture. Aquaculture is no different than agriculture, but it's in water. And in water, you can grow the same as in agriculture. You can grow a cash crop, you can grow coffee, tea, or also you can grow rice. 
and it's the same with aquaculture. Aquaculture, it's not just salmon or tilapia or shrimp. It's also about mollusks. It's also about using what we have for free. And that is, you know, we have 70% of our planet covered with water. And we need to really start gearing up and producing much more food from there. Um, so we have 510 species that we have to feed. And so from a nutritional perspective, we have to know what to put in those diets. And obviously for terrestrial animals, it's a lot less, so it's a, a lot easier in, in a sense in that we know much more uh, about poultry nutrition, hog nutrition, ruminant nutrition than we do about many of the species we culture. Um, in terms of the top fed species, in first place are the Chinese fed carps, 12.5 million tons, the average growth rate 5.6% per year, and the value of the industry. So here you've got the top 11 major groups, the carps, tilapia, shrimp, catfish, salmon, marine fish, freshwater, miscellaneous freshwater fish are mainly the colosomas, the, the um, barramundi, diadromous fishes, freshwater crustaceans, milkfish, trout, and eel. So if you remember, we had something like Global aquaculture production was 90 million tons. Of that 90 million tons, about 36 million tons are, are species that we're actually um, feeding with a diet. So on average, the growth is quite good, 8% per year. Um, and again, what I'm going to do is go through all the different species just very quickly, but just to give you a message, and that is China, China, China. And that is, if you look at Chinese uh, fed carp production, 90% of the production is coming from China. If we look at um, tilapia production, again, the major producer in the world is China, followed by Egypt, Indonesia, Brazil, the Philippines. Uh, Brazil is a good example of a country that's, Brazil is the third largest feed manufacturer in the world in terms of animal feed. It has most of the ingredients, and it's a country that pretty soon will overtake Chile in terms of the resources that it has. The only problem with Brazil, it has to import the fish meal from Chile at the moment. But it really has the market in that everything is sold domestically. Um, if we look at shrimp production, again, number one producer still is, is China, followed by Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, again, mainly primarily Asian countries, followed by um, Ecuador and Mexico and Brazil. But again, you know, we have an industry that's, that's $19 billion, but we don't know what the nutrient requirements are to put in the diet. Because there's so many ways of growing shrimp. There's so many densities, so many culture systems. And each culture system is different. It's not like salmon where we grow it in the same way. And really the feeds are very similar through all the different countries that produce salmon. With shrimp or with tilapia, with these species, it's very different. Um, and in the end, you have to come up with country-specific solutions for these species. If we look at catfish, number one producer in the world is Vietnam, followed again by China, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, the US. Um, salmon is the one example where you have hardly any Asian countries there. Number uh, first place is Norway, followed by Chile, the UK, Canada, Faroe Islands, and Australia. Um, but again, the industry, it's, it's worth a lot of money and, and it's growing very well at the moment. And the consumer likes the product. It's just more and more and more the consumer wants to know where the product comes from and how it's produced and what feed. And, and it's, it's a fact of life. Um, if we look at trout, again, the, the largest producer in the world is, is Chile. In second place is Iran, Turkey, Norway. Again, it's is probably cultivated in more species and in more countries than any other species. It's trout, just like salmon. I mean, uh, shrimp. Uh, marine finfish again. China is is the world's largest producer. Um, in Egypt, it's in third place. Again, it's mainly mullet, grey mullet. Um, the Nile is very big, and it's a very important river, and and there's a lot of tradition. In second place is Japan, but then the sector there is, is suffering um, contraction rather than expansion. Um, but again, it's a sector that's, that's very profitable and, and a lot of interest. 
Diagemus, freshwater species, again, China, the largest producer, followed by Brazil, Indonesia, and other countries, again. You know, at the moment, we produce all our food on 29% of our planet, and many people are always saying the future is marine, fin fish, offshore. You know, people live on the Earth, and we still have to produce food there. And if you look at 90%, well, no, 85% of fish production are still freshwater fishes. Um, and so these species are very, very important. And again, in countries like Brazil, um, it's a sector that's growing very, very, very fast. Freshwater crustaceans, again, China stands out as the largest producer. Eels, and this is the last slide on, on, on the species. Um, but again, you get a sense of feeling that China is... It's big, it's the largest producer of, of many commodities. Um, and the problem is how are we going to feed ourselves in the future? Uh, milkfish, sorry, that was the last one there. Again, this is very much... Um, did I go the wrong way? I? Sorry. Milkfish is Indonesia, Philippines um, and Taiwan. Okay, so basically we have a, um, about 40 million tons of, of feed for these species. As I said before, the major species are carps, tilapia, shrimp, catfish, and then salmonids. Um, but again, if you look at animal feed production, China is, is there. In terms of animal feed production, it's still the largest producer of animal feed in the world. It's overtaken the U.S. Um, and you can see here Brazil is, is, is second in terms of global animal feed production. And so aquaculture, again, these are, this is from the survey of, of Autec, um, 23 million tons of, of feed. Um, and so I've done some projections. If we look at the growth up to now, we have a, a sector growing on average about 10% per year from 95 to 2012. Um, if I just assume a modest growth rate, and I look at each of the species, but on average it's about 5.4% per, per year, um, the feed production is, is estimated to increase to 50, 65 to 87 million tons by 2025. But we're nothing compared to the production of terrestrial animal feeds. Terrestrial animal feeds is 950 million tons. So aqua is 40, 50, it's still small. But even though we're small, we still consume 75% of the fish meal in the world, or over 80% of the fish oil in the world. And the problem is not so much today, it's tomorrow, and how can we keep the sector growing in a, in a good way? Um, and so if you look at the 40 million tons that we're currently um, consuming in terms of feed, there's about 24 million tons of feed which are basically fed to the herbivorous, omnivorous finfish species like the carp, <coughs> tilapia, catfish. And these are the most flexible in terms of feeding habits. You know, they feed low on the food chain. There are many, many ingredients that we can use and we can choose. We have about 8 million tons of... Um, Freshwater, I mean, of crustaceans, which are basically shrimp, freshwater prawns, crawfish. These are a bit less flexible, um, but it depends on the culture system. Depending on the culture system, you can really um, change their dietary requirements. And then you have 8 million tons of carnivorous species, the salmonids, marine finfish. Um, and these are the less flexible in terms of nutrition. They're carnivores or they're, they feed high on the food chain. And so this is the industry at present that's most reliant on marine ingredients. Um, and basically what I've done here quickly is just separate, um, looking at the major ingredients that we tend to use in our feeds. And, and basically the main categories here are what I call aquatic protein meals and oils, which are the fish meals and oils from wild or farm fish, squid meal, krill meal, Seaweed meals and products. Again, there are many seaweed products that are high in protein. You won't believe it. Um, and also you've got the cultured microbial biomass, which are bacteria, yeast, algae. All of them 
are cultured in water, in an aquatic medium. And then you have the terrestrial um, animal proteins that come from the livestock sector, poultry byproducts, porcine byproducts, ruminant byproducts, terrestrial invertebrates, some people interested in producing insects. Then we have the largest source of, of protein, globally speaking, that's the oilseed proteins and byproducts, the cereal protein byproducts, the pulse protein byproducts, others. And then we have the fillers, the, the ingredients that we normally use in feeds to, to, to provide um, digestible carbohydrate. And then we have the feed additives, um, on average between 0 and 5%, which are the vitamins, antioxidants, pigments, minerals, trace elements, salt, amino acids, nucleotides, feeding attractants, gut modifiers, prebiotics, probiotics, acidifiers, soon. Um, by, and a whole variety of other products. So basically, I've just split them 25%, 25, 25, 25, 25, and then 5. Um, so this adds up to 105. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Anyway, no, but here I'll change it. <coughs> they all add up to 105. You're right. Anyway, sorry. Um, but here, basically, f the formulations of basically um, herbivorous, omnivorous species, um, basically the use of uh, marine or aquatic proteins is quite small. The use of rendered products is quite higher. Um, but the main source of protein usually are the plant oilseed meals and, and uh, products and then the fillers. Um, if we look at um, marine carnivorous species, it's more um, dependent on um, aquatic animal proteins um, and then followed by the terrestrial products and the, and the vegetable proteins here. And shrimp, again, a bit less dependent on marine um, aquatic protein sources, less use of rendered products, but again, mainly using... Um, and every country is different, every species is different, and it depends on prices and, and the market where you're selling your product. Um, but one point I wanted to say that I think it's important is that replacing fish, fish meal from a nutritional perspective is very, very good. But... Replacing it is not just about replacing protein because fish meal contains many other nutrients um, inside it which we have to replace if we're going to replace it with other um, ingredients. And at the end of the day, the important thing to remember is that fish, shrimp, humans, we have a requirement for nutrients, not for ingredients. It's just that fish meal as an ingredient is perfect because it has everything inside it. But from a nutritional perspective, there's nothing that we cannot replace. Um, and that's, to, that's fish meal, or it's fish oil. It's the same. Fish oil, two minutes. is more than just um, a source of lipids. It's a source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids, but also of cholesterol, fat-soluble vitamins, carotenoids, and many other factors. And I think that was my penultimate slide. And so at the end of the day... Replacing fish meal and fish oil, it's a necessity that we have to do. It's an ingredient we like, um, but there's no, obviously not enough of it to go around, so our ways are now are trying to extend it the most we can. Um, for some species, like the tilapias, the carps, we don't need it anyway. But for the higher value species, it's, it's not something that's not replaceable. And this is my last slide, and it's just emphasizing the importance of research and development to reduce cost to, to make the industry more sustainable. And this is uh, in Brazil, where I'm working now mainly on, on um, shrimp and also marine finfish. Again, trying to make the industry more and more sustainable and profitable. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Albert. We do have time for two quick questions. We will have more time at the end of this uh, first part for discussion, but I would welcome some questions from the audience. Again, I'm sorry about so many slides and statistics. No, it's it's just perfect. Uh, Albert, this morning we... Ah, sorry. Thank you. And one? Yeah, Albert, uh, as we know, this morning two speakers said that uh, fish and also uh, fish and Chicken also be, will be a good sporter in source in the next, and chicken will be a winner because of uh, yeah in terms of uh, our fish 
you know, the price is very high and then uh, environmental issue. Uh, what do you, what, uh, do you have any comment about this, how aquaculture product uh, can be the winner for? I mean, it, it already is the winner. I mean, all I'm just saying is, is, yeah. is you know, already Asia produces 91%. If you go to Indonesia, Philippines, yeah. most countries there, in terms of the cost of animal protein, fish is more cheaper than I am, than right, chicken, than, right, than right. other. I, I, I have also calculation for between chicken and fish. Actually, uh -uh. fish will be uh, lower. Than, than chicken. Yeah, I just think the important thing is that we don't put all our eggs in one basket in terms of concentrating on one species or another. It's like at the end of the day, we have to produce d different aquatic products depending on the money in your in your pocket. And we have one type of consumer, and we have the other consumer that wants something more affordable. And I think Asia is a good example that we've we've done that. But also, we're looking at the higher end as well. Um, but I think the I mean. I'd, his presentation was, was really, really very good. But I think his view on aquaculture is very much the view from Norway and from the salmon in perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adel? Uh, Sorry, we'll just wait for the microphone, please. No. Here. Yeah, uh, Albert, do, do you think, uh, should we learn from the livestock industry by limiting the number of species we should farm to, to make this industry really grow? Uh, because if we, we need to focus on our research, breeding programs and whatever, it's so hard to work with 400 species. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. I think, you know, that's because everybody wants, because of the, on the one side we have people saying we must work with native species. Um, but like you say, the, 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 the reality is, 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 is by value, the, the number one cultivated product is shrimp. But we don't even know what the dietary methionine requirement is. You know, and, and, and with poultry we, and with salmon, we really do know down to the digestible nutrient levels what to put in the feeds. But most of these other species that are grown in, in most of the Asian countries, we still have got so much work to do. And I think we, we, sh you know, we should try and limit. But at the end of the day, it's... And if you look at the major species produced in the world, at the end of the day, they're, they're not so many. You know, we have over 400 different species, but at the end of the day, it's probably a handful of... One more quick question there at the back. Thank you. One question, three parts. Uh, you showed the growth rates the last years. Um, and concerning uh, or towards the 9 billion people, what we have to feed in uh, 2050. Uh, can we maintain these growth rates in the future or can we accelerate or speed up more than nowadays? Second part is where do you see the future for uh, the offshore or the onshore business for the fish farming business? Is it, will it be on the coast side, on the, on the sea side or will it be on the land side in the future? And uh, the third part uh, is uh, what is the winning species maybe okay. the next years? Good one. No, um, <laughs> it's like, yes, I mean, if we're going to feed 9 billion people, they're going to be on land. So land, you know, because again, offshore, a lot of people talk about that's going to be the future of aquaculture. And all I'm saying is, it's going to be the future of marine aquaculture. And if you look at the moment, if you look at marine aquaculture, it's 80, it's 40% aquatic plants and mollusks, filter feeders, both species that we don't have to supply nutrients to. But they employ lots of people, and we have lots of sunlight and lots of coasts in the world. Um, but in terms of offshore, yes, I mean, the, but the problem is, most of the problem with, with offshore is that in Asia, in Japan, in most, in most countries where we grow marine fish in cages, there's not an environment problem perception. I mean, at the moment, we live on 29% on of our planet, the land, and on that land, we have tourism, we have urban areas, we have forestry, we have ag agriculture, no problem. But when it comes to the sea, which is a public resource, it's a shared resource, in some countries people don't like to see anything floating in the water, so they're saying <laughs> offshore. But offshore, your cost of production, everything is, is so much higher that the industry has to focus on, on the higher value species. And these higher value species need protein. And so the problem is... You know, we, we still have 4 billion people that earn less than $4 a day, 23 people that die every minute because of undernutrition. And it's important that aquaculture is seen as part of the solution, not part of the problem. 
So I think offshore there's a lot we can do. Per lehan lehan, slowly, slowly. But it has. Um, but the but in aquaculture we've just tended to copy the higher value species that we've caught from capture fisheries because they they have the highest prices. Thank you, Albert. Thank you very much for Sorry. the nice perspective on aquaculture.